with me to the book of 1 Samuel, chapter number 1, verses 1 through verse number 11. First Samuel chapter 1, verses 1 through verse number 11. There was a certain man of Ramathaim, Zophim, of the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, the son of Jehoram, son of Elihu, son of, El son of Tohu, son of Zuth, and Ephrathite. He had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. Now this man used to go up year by year from his city to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh, where the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests of the Lord. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Penina, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her though the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival used to provoke her grievously to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year, as often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore Hannah wept and would not eat. And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep and why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? And am I not more to you than ten sons? After they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. Now Eli, Eli, the priest, was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. Verse number 11 reads, And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him back to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall touch his head. Thank you. You may have your seat. The grass withers and the flower fades. But the word of our God shall stand forever. I want to talk a minute about a wise mother. Hannah is a wise, wise mother. There have been a lot of focus recently in the news in recent years on the stock market. If you watch the news, it does not take the commentator long to tell you either how well or how poorly the S&P 500 is doing or the Dow Jones Industrial Average or what's happening in the Asian and European markets. In fact, there are trillions of dollars invested in the stock market. And the people who place their money there do so with the hope and the intention that their stocks will do well and will make them a profit. They invest with uh, Charles Schwab or some other uh, brokering firm where they put their money, their investments to make sure that their stock portfolio grows and in years to come they are investing that their future will turn out well. I don't have much money in the stock market. Uh, I just have a little retirement money and even that little money is being handled by some people who are smarter than I am. However, while I may not investigate the markets, 
and know what's going on in terms of navigating stocks, I am still an active investor in many areas of my life. Every action, every attitude, every activity is an investment in something that will either glorify God or bring glory to my flesh. In the stock market, a wise investor will study the stocks before he or she invests so that he can maximize the return on their potential dividends. Those who would make a wise investment in their lives would do the same in order to receive the greatest dividend on your life. Yeah. Hannah yes, sir. was a shrewd investor of her life. She made some very wise investments that continue to reap dividends even this morning. This morning, I would like for us to take a glimpse at Hannah's portfolio. I want to point to some areas where she made some wise investments and encourage you to hang in there, keep on investing, it's going to pay off after a while. Uh, Hannah made an investment in her family. Now this is not the best of situations. Hannah is married to Elkanah who is also married to Penina. It's not the best of situations. But in spite of that difficulty, Hannah invested in her family. Because she's mentioned first, Hannah is Elkanah's first wife. But she cannot have children God has closed her womb. And so in antiquity, uh, a man's virility is judged by how many children he has. And so Elkanah marries another woman named Penina, who is fertile and bears children. Hannah has his heart, but Penina has his children. Hannah is a godly woman and God for his own purposes has shut up her womb while Penina is rude and insolent, evil and mean-spirited. Hannah is best suited to raise children but she doesn't have any. Penina is crass and mean-spoken and she has many children. It seems that way sometimes. People who don't need children seem to have them whenever they feel like it. And people who are best suited to raise them, God for his own purposes has shut up their womb. And Hannah is heartbroken because she wants to give her husband children. It's difficult in that situation. But in spite of the difficulty, she does not abandon the household. I want you to, I want you to get the gravity of this. Penina, who is mean and has ugly ways, even the name Penina sounds messy. Don't name your daughter Penina. That sounds like somebody who's trashy and messy and, and rude and ugly acting. Hannah, she knows that Elkanah really in his heart loves Hannah. And so every day she rubs salt in Hannah's womb. She's always picking at her, reminding her that you're not a woman, reminding her that 
He married you first, but I got his children. Evil speaking, taunting her, teasing her, always rubbing it in her face. Penina is rude and mean-spirited, crass and ugly acting. And she's always making Hannah cry. You got his heart, but I got his children. He married you, but look what I got. Look what you got, but look what I got. Ugly, mean, always making Hannah cry. And that's a difficult situation to be in. And brothers and sisters, let me hurry and say to us, family is difficult. I, I could handle family if I didn't have any people in it. People make families difficult. Somebody ought to help me here. You got a brother or sister who's always taunting you. Rubbing it in your face. Jealous of you. That's, that's what Penina's real problem is. She's jealous because Elkanah loves Hannah. But God for his own reasons has closed up Hannah's womb. And in your family, they don't always wish you well. In the families, there's bitterness, there's rancor, there's anger, there's right underneath the surface some tension, some strife, and all it takes is a moment for it to explode. In some families, the air is always electric. There's always tension in the air because there's some unresolved conflict. There's some bitterness that is right underneath the surface and all it takes is a spark and a fire starts and families quit speaking to each other for years because family is difficult. But as difficult as family is, you don't walk out on your family. As mean as your family is, you don't cuss out your family. As bad and as tense as it is in families, you gotta stay there and invest in that boy. Invest in that girl. And it may look like right now that it's not gonna pay off. But keep on putting it in them. 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 Because when they're growing up, when they're small, they are mean and insolent and always mad. They're grouchy. If you got two children, one of them going to be crazy. And, and if you got one, he's half crazy. But just keep on putting it in them. Keep on training them. Keep on teaching them. Keep on living right in front of them. Keep on setting a godly example. Keep on walking in the word. Keep on reading the Bible. Keep on bringing them to church. Keep on making them go to choir practice. Keep on making them come to usher's meeting. If you be not weary, somebody ought to help me here. You in the church right now because your mother, your father, your grandmother, your grandfather invested in you. Yeah. Yeah. Hannah. Yeah. Hannah could have easily walked out on that situation because trashy Penina that name just sound messy. Mean Penina is always picking at her. Always rubbing in her face. Always pouring salt in the wounds. Making her always feel bad because in that day, not to have a child made you less than a woman. And so Hannah feels less than 
Hannah feels marginalized. Hannah feels out of the loop. Hannah feels that she's not measuring up. And Penina does not let up on it. The scripture says year after year, after year, after year, Hannah put up with that. Hannah shows us how to stand up under constant ridicule without giving up. Brothers and sisters, it's always too soon to give up. Somebody here has given up on a marriage too soon. Given up on your son too soon. Given up on your dreams too soon. No matter how difficult it is, no matter how stressful it is, never, never, never give up. Hannah is in it year after year after year after year and the situation grows increasingly difficult. But she stays there in spite of the difficulty. Not only does she stay in spite of difficulty, she stays in spite of discouragement. Uh, every year, usually it's three times a year, but now they've gone down to once a year making an annual trip uh, to Jerusalem to make sacrifice. And Elkanah is taking Hannah and uh, Penina and all his children and everything he owns to the making of the sacrifice. And this year, Hannah is weeping and she will not eat. And then her husband says to her, Hannah, what's the matter? Why are you so sad? Am I not better than ten sons? Look, look at how he loves her. As in spite of the difficulty, in spite of the discouragement, in spite of the, the situation, Hannah can't see it because when you're discouraged, it disorients you. When you're in a difficult situation, you always see the glass half empty rather than half full. He says, why are you sad? Why are you crying? Am I not better to you than ten sons? Because the scripture says he gives Penina, his sons, and his daughters their portion, but he gives Hannah a double portion. Whatever he gives Penina, he gives Hannah double that but Hannah does not want a double portion she wants a child she wants a son to present to her husband and, and they are on their way up to the festival on their way up to the feast and Penina is saying look at what I got look at what you got you ain't doing nothing look at what I got you got his heart but I got his children he ain't leaving me. He ain't putting me out yet. I'm still here. And here they are on their way up to the feast. And Hannah is weeping and she will not eat. But in her discouragement, stay with me now, she has an out. She has a weapon that she hasn't yet used on Penina. Penina's been picking at her and uncovering the scab and criticizing her because she can't bear children. But Hannah has a weapon she hasn't used yet. The only weapon you have against your enemy is prayer. Because when you pray, God will take care of your enemy. I wish I had somebody to help me preach it. The old folk in my home used to say, if you pray and pray right, God will hear and answer your prayer and God will shut the mouth of your enemy. Yeah. Fret not yourself because of evildoers. Neither be envious against the workers of iniquity. For they shall soon be cut off like grass and they shall wither like the green herb. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom 
shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes, came on me to eat up my flesh, just before they got to me, God tripped them. And the trap they set for me, God saw to it that they fell in it themselves. Have I got a witness here? God will take care of your enemies, but you can't fight fire with fire. The only weapon you have that works is prayer. Hannah went to the temple and she started praying. She wouldn't eat. She's weeping. And she's praying in her heart. Read it when you get home. The scripture says her mouth is moving, but no words are coming out. Somebody here who's been through some difficulty, who's been discouraged, knows that there are sometimes you pray and no words can come out. Because you know what you feel but you can't put it in the words I wish I had a believer here you know how bad things are going in your life but you can't verbalize it you can't express it in words because the pain is so deep that you cannot even bear words to touch it now if you haven't been there you don't know when to shout it's going to be time to shout in a minute and you won't even, you, you're going to miss it because I'm not talking about a headache right now. I'm not talking about a sprained ankle. I'm not talking about your wrist is bothering you. I'm talking about a pain that's deep down on the inside that nobody knows anything about but you and God. Come on, talk back to me if you can. You can't even tell your friends about this because there are some things that go on in our lives that we can't express. A child that's on our heart that's burdening us and we got to laugh to keep from crying. We got to smile when our heart is broken. We got to keep on going when we feel like staying in the house. Anybody here ever been there? I said anybody here ever been there? I'm not talking about a little ache and a little pain. I'm talking about your heart is so broken that you can't even get the words out. Mm. Hannah just cries, mourns, praying. The words come out. And Eli, the priest, sees Hannah in the temple with her mouth moving, and he thinks she's drunk. R read it. This is in the text. Read it when you get home. He says, God, put that wine away. And stop acting like that in the house of God. And Hannah says, oh, my Lord, I'm not drunk. My soul is weary. I've been weeping and mourning and I'm in the temple because I want to pray and there's somebody in here this morning getting happy and look like you're drunk. Look like you're losing your mind and people getting tired of you cutting up every Sunday. Getting tired of you shouting every time you turn around. Matter of fact, they didn't want to sit next to you anymore because they don't know when you're going to explode but they don't know what you're going through. And I want to encourage somebody this morning. If Psalm 142 don't work, if Psalm 54 don't work, try Psalm 34. I complained and God didn't do anything. I prayed and God didn't come to my rescue. So I'm a shout in the midst of my trouble. You better get out of my way. 
you better leave me alone. I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on Jesus. I came here to tell God about my trouble. My heart is broken. My soul is weary. And you think I'm going to let you intimidate me about how I give God glory? Hey! I will bless the Lord. Now watch this. Pay attention to this. Eli is criticizing Hannah for how she's acting in the temple. And he can't do nothing with his own children. Hophni and Phinehas, sons of Eli, God is going to kill both of them on the same day. Because the glory of God is gone from Israel because of Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. And Eli has the nerve to criticize Hannah when he can't handle his own children. That's just like some people at Lily Grove, ain't it? All of a sudden, they're the morality police. Because they done got old and can't run women no more. Have I got a witness? All of a sudden, they're the salvation police. Because they've done everything in the book, outside the book, on top of the book. And they've even written another book. And now they're criticizing how you live your life. If you're living in a glass house, somebody ought to help me preach it. Don't criticize other people's way of praising God and your house is messed up. You don't know what somebody went through to get here this morning. You don't know how many tears they've had to shed. You don't know how many burdens they've had to bear investing in their family. Staying there when things got difficult. Staying there in spite of discouragement. My mother could have aborted me. But she stayed right there. She could have left my father and I'd be raised in a house with a single parent. But in spite of the difficulty, in spite of the discouragement, she stayed right there to make an investment in her children. And I would see my mother late at night. She would not go to sleep until all of us got in the house. And every foot that fell on the porch, she knew who it was. She didn't have to open the door. She didn't have to crack the blind. She just heard a footstep. And she said, that's Steve. That's Bobby coming in. That's Ray right there. She knew our footfalls because she birthed us. She stayed there and invested in us. And at night, I'd see my mother on her knees calling every one of our names. And she said, Lord, let me live long enough to see my children grown. Let me stay here long enough to take care of my children, to provide for my children, to be a mother for my... And my mother stayed right there and invested in us. I would not be who I am today if my mother had not invested in my family. Oh, for the touch of a vanished hand and the sound of a voice now still. I'd give anything to hear my mother's voice again. But I see her on the other side and after I fall at Jesus' feet, I'm going to tell my mama again, thank you for investing in me because I would not be who I am right now 
if you didn't stay through the difficulty. Stay through the discouragement. And Eli thought that Hannah was drunk because of how she praised God. And listen, don't let nobody at this church intimidate you when you get ready to praise God. Because you done been through enough to give God some hallelujah praise. You, you've had enough storms in your life that God has brought you through. You've had enough difficulty. You've had enough discouragement in your life. And God delivered you every time. And then you're sitting by somebody who's mean enough to say to you, it don't take all that. Speak for yourself. It don't take all that for you because you ain't got nothing. But it takes all of that for me. I will bless the Lord at all times. If I got to bless him by myself, if I've got to shout by myself, if I've got to praise him by myself, I've been through enough. And if he doesn't do anything else, he's already done more than enough. And here's Hannah's prayer. I'm going to get to the rest of this in the next service. But here's Hannah's prayer. She said, Lord, if you give me a son, I promise you, I make a vow to you that I'll give him back to you all the days of his life. And parents, here's the mistake we make. We have children to ourselves and don't give them back to the Lord. We have children to build up our posterity. We have children sometimes for our own ego. We have children sometimes to satisfy some need in ourselves to nurture. But if you want that boy, that girl, to be everything they ought to be when they are born, give them back to the Lord. Listen, Hannah made sure that Samuel's heroes were not outside the church. You missed the opportunity to shout. She made sure that Samuel's heroes were not outside the church. She kept him in the temple. She kept him in the church to make sure that his influencers were people at the church. Bring your children to church so that folk at church who mean good can influence them. Single mother, bring your boy to church. There's some godly men around here who can help him. Bring your daughter to church. There's some godly woman around here who can help them. I was at my sister-in-law's funeral not long ago. And a young man who is a member of this church now, from my hometown in Eunice, where I'm from, he's a member here, Myers Allison. Myers might even be in church this morning. But uh, Myers prayed at my sister-in-law Jocelyn's funeral. He's not a deacon, he's not a trustee, doesn't teach a Sunday school class. He's just a strong, godly Christian young man. And he prayed at my sister-in-law's funeral. And after the funeral, Myers uh, came to me at the repast and said, Reverend, I've been a member of Lily Grove since I've been in Houston. He said, you baptized me, you raised me as a child. When I was at True Light, you baptized me. I didn't have a father growing up. My mother did the best she could. But all my life, I watched you and Mr. Johnny. And, and, and I want to take this opportunity to say to you that I'm the man that I am because I kept my eyes on you all my growing up years. And when you left Eunice to come to Lily Grove, I knew if I ever moved to Houston, I would join the church where you are because you made such an impact on my life. You don't know who's watching you. You don't know who's paying attention to your life. 
but keep on investing just keep on pouring it out just keep on pouring it out and God will let some drops fall on somebody and they will come back one day and tell you the influence you made on their life and I need to say this to some woman here who's never had a child God has closed up your womb I want to say to somebody in words of encouragement that you don't have to bear children to be a mother just walk right just live right God for his own purposes kept you from having children of your own so he could give you other people's children to influence so he could get single hearted devotions out of you to make you not just your child's mother but other people's children's mother that's the kind of mother my mother was my mother disciplined us with strong discipline my mother was not one of those types who said wait till your daddy get home no I, I was wishing my daddy would get home to take off me I was wishing my daddy would get home to stop her from shooting one of us my mother was not was not afraid to discipline every morning when we woke up during the summertime with no school, there were 10 switches on the porch. Because she had 10 children. And she said, just in case you start something. Uh, and, and somebody would come to our house and say, may I whip them, but it don't do no good. She said, don't say that in front of me. I don't like to hear nobody talk like that. Don't, don't talk like that in front of me because you're going to make me make you go home. You're going to make me mad talking like that. She said, you ain't doing it right. Because uh, if you do it right, it may not change their mind, but it'll change their way. And, 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 and if you do it right, all they can do is go to sleep. All they can do is take a nap. A good whipping to make him take a good nap. A good long nap. You tired and they tired. But then you would pass by our house and would think it was a house party going on because my mother played with us. She danced with us. We had a good time together. She taught me how to swing out. You better ask somebody. I can dance because my mother taught me how to dance. She said, you'll never get a girlfriend if you don't know how to dance. She had a good time with us. She raised us to fear God, to go to church, to respect our elders because she stayed home and made investments in us. The operative word is she stayed home. Because you can't be your children's friend and party with them in the club and let them see different men coming in the house every night and then try to discipline them. No, you got to walk right in front of them so that they will see your godly example. Hannah prayed and God answered and Samuel was born and although the glory had gone from Israel it returned in the birth of Samuel because you remember Samuel he worked in the temple with Eli and then when God got ready to fire Saul he sent Samuel to Jesse's house to pour out the anointing oil on Israel's future king. And Saul was fired, but Samuel anoints David. And we know David because of Samuel. We know Samuel because of Hannah. And we know Hannah because God closed her womb to teach us that when he gets ready to prosper us, no penina can stand in our way. Yeah. 
This last word, and I'm gonna leave you alone. You saw it on television, uh, Kevin Durant stood to receive his trophy as the NBA's most valuable player. You saw it. And with tears in his eyes, he thanked his mother. He said, when you didn't eat, you made sure we ate. You kept us off the streets. This award belongs to you. You, mama, are the most valuable player. Newscasters, hardened sportscasters, couldn't help from crying, listening to that boy talking about his mother being his most valuable player. I wept when I saw that on television. But I got another most valuable player. Thank God for my mother. Thank God for my father. But one Friday, on a skull-shaped hill, and on a blood-soaked cross, my most valuable player took my place on the cross. He died for me. But early, early Sunday morning, he got up from the grave with all power in his hand so that now, thank God for my mother, thank God for my grandmother, thank God for my father, but more than that, thank God for Jesus who became sin for us who knew no sin that we might become the righteousness of God. Thank God for Jesus who took my place at the cross that I might have a right to the tree of life. He's my most valuable player. Thank God for Jesus who wrote my name in the Lamb's book of life.